Today's video is sponsored by Audible. Visit audible.com slash found and explained to start your free 30 day trial. The Concorde was going to change the way we fly, able to cross oceans in mere hours, beating all known methods of transport when it came to speed, it was the leapfrog that airlines couldn't afford to miss. But the Concorde actually had far more orders beyond the two carriers British Airways and Air France, who would eventually fly it. Who were these other airlines? Where would have they flown the plane? And why did these deliveries never happen? On a brisk winter morning in 1972, a supersonic flying machine touched down in Sydney, Australia. The Concorde and the future of aviation had arrived down under. Officials at Qantas lined up to place, at this point, a no-brainer order, for the jet was here to change aviation forever. So far, the plane had been ordered by both British Airways and Air France, whose parent countries had spent billions of dollars developing the airframe. Seven each for each airline. But apart from this, no other airline had yet converted its options into actual orders. The first option agreement that had been signed was with launch customer Pan Am, who optioned six Concorde aircraft in 1963 and then optioned another two in 1966. Pan Am would have used these just like Air France and BA to cross over to Europe over the ocean. Continental followed soon with an option for three Concords, as well as TWA who optioned six. American Airlines also had options in North America for six aircraft, but seemingly only after arrival Pan Am made the first move. Near the end of the first year of the Concorde on its sales run, Middle Eastern carrier MEA optioned four aircraft from France. They would operate this plane from Beirut to New York, landing in Toulouse to refuel, and a supersonic two-hour trip to London. MEA's Concorde philosophy was summed up by the airline's leadership at the time. Getting the president of an American oil company to fly to New York in 8 hours instead of 14 is something to sell. Today, what do we offer for the 40% high first class fare? A wider chair and free whiskey? To offer 8 hours instead of 14 makes it worth 40% more. That is how we see the Concorde. We hope and pray that it will work because it will be a great thing for MEA. And for Lebanon. I couldn't have put in the time to research this video and others without the help from Audible. Audiobooks have been an absolute game changer for me, and Audible allows me to research and relax on the fly whilst I do other things, like creating the graphics for the videos that you watch today. I highly recommend checking out How to Land an Airbus A330 by a none other than James May. I guarantee you'll be laughing just from the sample clip, but heck, you might even learn a thing or two or how to land a widebody. But Audible's much more than just audiobooks. Everything from comedy, original series, and sleeping tracks, which is super helpful for me when my mind is buzzing like a prop engine. If you want to jump on board like me, then visit audible.com slash foundandexplained or text foundandexplained to 500 500 to start your free 30-day trial. The next year in 1964, Qantas would option for aircraft. They would have used the plane for flights over the outback to Singapore, although many said that the range wouldn't quite work, but we'll get to that later. Following Qantas, we have Air India with two options and Japan Airlines with three. Japan, being a country completely surrounded by water, would have been spoiled for choice when it came to choosing supersonic routes. Then, forcing their way to the Concorde order book on seemingly the same weekend, Eastern Airlines racked up two options which they would expand to six, and was quickly followed by United the very next day with their own choice of six options for the Concorde. Braniff International would close out the year with options for three aircraft. 
during its tenure, Braniff would actually hire the Concorde to run a few promotional flights over three years from Washington to Dallas, operating the aircraft with its own crews. As the plane wasn't allowed to go supersonic in US airspace, the pilots were not trained in its faster operation. Imagine sitting behind the controls of one of the world's most powerful planes and not being able to throttle it up. Lufthansa would round out the major orders with three aircraft, followed by Sabina with two aircraft and Air Canada with four options. There was also an option for three aircraft from the Chinese government, which is dubious if it would have even gone ahead in 1972. The plane was planned to be used to fly VIPs and limited routes from Beijing. Now, this is seriously rumor territory, but some say that FedEx also looked at using the Concorde to transfer packages super quickly over oceans with a fleet of 10 aircraft. But the plane didn't have a cargo door and wouldn't have been able to rate it very far at all with a fuel cargo belly. Knowing the modern world's desire for same day shipping, we wouldn't rule out how useful it would have been. The last aircraft that had options for the Concorde was Iran Air. The airline at the time was obsessed with having the very biggest and greatest aircraft and having two supersonic jets plus a single option for another one was no issue at all for them. These orders were likely made because the Shah of Iran was close with France and wanted to maintain good relations. But it's also possible that he simply wanted them for his own ego. After all, we all know what happened a few short years later with the Iran Revolution. All we know about the aircraft with Iran Air that they would have been used for routes linking to Europe and was actually hired for that purpose a few times when it actually operated. Tehran to North America would have been outside the range of this plane, and because Iran is pretty much landlocked within Asia, it would have been pretty hard to operate these international routes without cooperation from other countries. It seemed that the Concorde dream was in full swing with 44 options across 10 airlines, but this was very much short of the 150 aircraft needed for the program to break even, but a good start nonetheless. These options would never be confirmed, and like a deck of cards, a slight nudge would make them all fall down. You see, these orders were only options, and some of them were vague as a promise from a friend to help you move house, as in, not solid at all. In 1973, rising oil prices led the Concorde to become increasingly unprofitable, and the sonic boom became a political football no country wanted to be left holding. Besides, the plane itself was also growing far more expensive, its price tripling from the 20 million US it was first predicted to be to 60 million US, which is 349 million US dollars today. This led launch customer Pan Am to reconsider its options, and later that year outright cancel them. The carrier wasn't doing well at the time, and it wasn't able to secure financing to go forward with the orders even if it wanted to. The airline had been quoted a price of $46 million per Concorde, as opposed to the cheaper $25 million per new 747 that carried three times as many passengers. With Pan Am losing faith in the program, other North American operators, American Airlines, Continental, United Airways, Air Canada, TWA, and Banff International would follow suit. TWA would cancel their options within minutes of Pan Am, very much leading to the idea that all these carriers were deep in discussion to abandon the supersonic dream together. Although Brandf International would go on to use the Concorde many years later as a promotional tool as noted earlier. Sir George Edwards, chairman of the British Aircraft Corporation, along with France's equivalent, said, We should not describe this as a fatal blow, but it's a hell of a setback. Without American rivals using the Concorde in the Pacific, 
Japan didn't really need the plane, and with Japan not ordering it, this led to China failing to make payments on its options and having its options cancelled by the 1980s. Other operators like MEA would let the options expire as they didn't want to be stuck with a somewhat experimental aircraft. These airlines also saw that if British Airways and Air France, who were guinea pigs in this situation, could make the Concorde profitable, then they could always reorder the aircraft. Plus, Boeing and others like Russia were working on their own version of the Concorde, dubbed the second generation supersonic jet, that would be cleaner, deal with the issues of sonic boom, and also have a much better performance. Planes that might have been bought for cheaper in the future. It seemed that being patient for these airlines was the best solution going forward. The last option order on this list is special because it was actually never cancelled. That's right, the Qantas order for four supersonic jets is still technically on the books and Qantas could very well demand that successor Airbus build them these jets that they have on option. Although we know that this will actually never happen, Qantas would go on to order the Boeing 747 for its Pacific aspirations. The Concorde would then go on to serve a unique slice of the market through carrier British Airways and Air France. It would be rented by some of the carriers above for special routes now and again, like Singapore who would even paint half the plane in their livery for routes operating from their hub. As well as Pepsi, yes the soft drink, who would use the plane as a promotional billboard. Its deep blue livery had to be specially certified as they were scared it would melt off during supersonic flight. But no airline would acquire the plane for themselves and even attempts as recent as 2003 to get it. That's right, our list doesn't stop back in modern history. In 2003, Richard Branson tried to acquire the retiring Concorde jets from British Airways following the crash of Air France 4590 and the downturn of the aviation industry following 9-11. He reasoned that if the planes were being retired, why not take on the supersonic mantle and keep them flying? although in bright virgin Atlantic colours. The billionaire first offered British Airways a single pound, or $1.53 US for the planes, the equivalent he claimed British Airways had paid for the plane to acquire them in the first place. He also said that there was a special requirement in the British Airways privatisation agreement, written back in the 1980s, that said that if BA no longer wanted the Concorde, then another British airline should be allowed to operate the supersonic fleet, a clause that lawyers weren't able to find much later. When BA dismissed the offer, he then switched up to a million pounds and eventually five million pounds per aircraft. Still not what they were worth new, but if the planes were heading to a museum, many reasoned that it would be worthwhile. The planes would have remained on the New York to London route, a cornerstone for the Virgin Atlantic market. Although later, many critics did suggest that Sir Richard Branson would have struggled to maintain the planes, especially since the spare parts required to fly were discontinued by Airbus in that very year in 2003, one of the reasons why the pressure was on to retire the plane. Looking back at history, we can see that the Concorde would have had a very different future if only a few key players had remained. If Pan Am had kept its order and had been financially solvent, then North America would have been a key investor in the Concorde's success. Not to be left behind in the sonic boom wake, other carriers in North America would have at least followed on and the Boeing 2707 would have come out of the workshop at any cost to stay competitive. If oil prices had not risen and Iran Air had kept its order, then we could have also seen the rest of Asia follow suit, and that mystery Qantas option for four planes fulfilled, leading to a world where you can get where you want to go fast. With smaller and faster jets, we might have seen the Boeing 747 regulated to simple cargo operations, and likely the Airbus A380 would have never have been built 
appearing only on this channel as a crazy fever dream for a never built project for all of us to captively watch a strange parallel future indeed. Today's video skipped over a few other reasons why the Concorde failed in the market. From countries using the sonic boom issue to leverage landing slots such as India and Malaysia, leading to the demise of the flight model, as well as the high profile crash of the Russian supersonic Concorde equivalent, the TU-144, which we'll cover in another video. But thanks so much for making it this far and learning that the Concorde really was about to become a huge success only for a very few interesting twists of history. If you want to check out more about this program, then we have a great website called foundandexplained.com which has plenty of more info. And if you want to support the channel, then we have a fantastic Patreon that you can watch videos early and decide on future topics. Again, if you like the video, let me know down in the comments what you think and subscribe for more. Thanks so much for watching.